But thank you very much for being here. I'm Tim Taylor with the Sacramento Queen Cities Coalition. And I wanted to welcome you all on behalf of the Sacramento Queen Cities Coalition, the Municipal Equipment Maintenance Association, the National Association of Fleet Administrators, the Sacramento Plug-in Electric Vehicle Collaborative, and the Sac Sacramento Metropolitan Board and all of whom inspired to try to put this thing together today. And all of whom have been around this summer. Um, today's schedule, I just want to quickly go through it. Our first recent presentation is David Worthington from the City County of Santa Clara. We'll be talking about trans EVs, transition planning and regulations that affect fleet operators. Then uh, we're going to have a quick run through of uh, some of the vendors that have brought equipment and other displays here to show you. Then David Rentschler will do a presentation with the fleet manager from the City of Fairfield. He will do a presentation on uh, infrastructure and facilities, CDB infrastructure and facilities. At lunch, then we'll have a break period where you can go out here and check out the displays, check out the vendors in the back of the room here, check them all out. And then we'll have lunch. And during our lunch time, we will have a keynote speech from Tom Swenson with Cummins. And he'll be talking about what Cummins is doing these days for zero and near zero uh, heavy duty engine technology. This afternoon, after the lunch period, we're at Casey Bellum in the Sacramento Municipal Utility District. We'll uh, present on the spec writing for DEV uh, technologies. And then we'll have another period where we can do displays and demo. And then before we jump right into the first presentation, which unfortunately was very late when I accomplished it, but I did want to say, I did want to recognize the board, the chairman, the chair, the president, excuse me, of the Sacramento Cities Coalition, uh, Keith Leach. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if Jaime Lemos is here. I haven't seen him, so he's with the Sacramento Air Quality Management District. He will be here later today. I would also like to recognize Chris White, who is here. Many of you that have been to previous presentations that we've done, remember that, that Chris has presented some very excellent information on planning for CDB transitions in terms of getting contract help. She's with Frontier Energy, and uh, she's probably done more ZEV transition plans for more fleets around the United States than anybody else. So, um, so now, without further ado, I'd you know, like to get started with uh, David Worthington, who's the fleet manager for the County of Santa Clara, and who has done an awful lot of this kind of work in the past. With the and uh, Water agencies, 
Okay, I'll address some of that in the slides. Uh, everybody, if there's some chairs, you might want to try to get over here. Otherwise, the presentation today will also be made available to you, so you'll be able to get a copy of it. There are links in it in the PDF that you can click on. We'll take you to CARP websites and a number of other websites. It has my contact information. What I'm providing you today is just a small portion of an overall presentation that uh, I've been given with Mr. Rachel over here throughout California over the last year. It usually takes about two to two and a half hours. So we're condensing down a lot of material into a very short period of time. There's a lot of material in the slides that I will not speak to, but you'll have it available when you get the PDF version. You can look it over. If you have any questions, please email me. So we'll go ahead and get started real quick. I'm going to skip the topics because they're hard to see up there, and we'll just get into this. So in California, we are now leading the way, and I would say worldwide, because of a couple different regulations. The first regulation was the Advanced Clean Trucks Regulation. That regulation was passed several years ago, and what that does is require manufacturers of trucks over 8,500 pounds, greater GVW, are to not actually just produce zero emission trucks, but to sell them. And CARB learned from previous regulations that requiring something to be produced didn't necessarily mean that that technology actually got implemented in fleets. So the ACT regulation actually forces manufacturers to produce and sell the vehicles in California if they want to have a presence here, and they have a percentage of overall sales that they have to meet. And each year or each every other year, that percentage goes up until they finally reach 2036, where 100% of all trucks, buses, everything, maybe not buses, transit, but a majority of everything sold in California will be zero emission vehicle. There's another um, regulation that relates to the light duty, the cars. And again, 2036, the only thing you'll be able to purchase new will be a zero emission vehicle in California. So the next regulation they worked on is the one I'll be focusing on today, which is, let's skip that one, that went too far. Okay, so the advanced clean trucks rule. The other regulation came about after that, and the one that goes into effect in January is the advanced clean fleets regulation. So we have the manufacturers, that have to produce and sell the vehicles. Now we've got a regulation for fleets where we have to purchase those vehicles. It's a symbiotic relationship. The timing is designed in the regulation to try to bring all that together at one time. Whether that happens or not, we'll have to wait and see because we're trending into new territory. And again, I think worldwide we're going to be leading this from California. 100% uh, sales requirement. So the Advanced Clean Fleets Rule is made up of four components. One of the four components is the, uh, some changes for the manufacturers on producing the vehicles. The other three components are the fleet hat. I'm going to talk about the fleet hat. So the, the, those three fleet components are divided up by drayage, high priority fleets and federal fleets, and then government, local government and state fleets. The drayage, nobody's here, but drayage are the trucks that go to ports, pick up containers, and then bring them to a depot or some location inside or outside of California. Because they're doing that all day in different ports in California, different rail yards, they produce a lot of emissions. The high priority and federal fleet fleets is actually private fleets and federal fleets. They have different, slightly different requirements than government and state fleets have. So it's very important to understand that each one of these three components has different timelines, different, different exemption processes, different types of vehicles that are exempt or not exempt. You need to be reading that specific uh, component regulation to understand how it affects your fleet. The only time it gets really tricky is when you have wastewater or water included with your general fleet. Then it gets even more complex. And in that situation, again, I encourage you to read the regulations and reach out to CARB staff. And again, start CARB staff credit. I was just talking to a gentleman at the table. Right now, I have never got such great customer service from them in 20 years. 
If I email or call them, I get a return phone call or email by the following day. I've never had that happen. Prior to this regulation of ACP, it would take anywhere from two weeks for me to get an email response. It may be even longer on a voicemail. So they're doing a great job. They want to answer the questions. Be prepared. They may not have the answers you're looking for, but they will work on it. They're doing a great job of it. So we'll go into, okay, ASC, the Advanced Clean Fleets Expansion, the Advanced Clean Trucks Regulation, because CARB has a waiver from the EPA to regulate our own emissions within California, other states can adopt the regulations that CARB produces in California for their own states. Many states have already done that with the ACT regulation because it's been out for three, three plus years. Now there's 17 other states and jurisdictions that are looking at adopting the Advanced Clean Fleets regulation. So when we talk about this just being in California, just be aware this is going to go across the country. As California goes, so goes the rest of the nation when it comes to regulations around emissions. So, can't see it really well, but on, the, on that slide, the 17 states in California make up approximately 36% of the production of applicable trucks in the country. 36%. The manufacturers are not going to pull out of California because of this regulation. They cannot afford to. They can't afford to pull out of the other states. So this will be going forward. How soon the other states adopt it? is just not known right now. It, it may be a couple years from now. Drive trucks will skip over. I have priority fleets. I'm going to step over here so I can read my slides. Rental fleets have some flexibility. They can do quarterly snapshots. So if, if your strategy is to rent trucks instead of owning them, you need to be aware of what the rental companies are going to be able to provide you. There's going to be a huge demand on rental companies, and I suspect that if everybody in the room wanted to rent from one organization, they will not have the volume of vehicles to supply to you. Because their, their fleet doesn't all have to be zero emission vehicles like the private and government fleets. So it's very important you understand that. Um, Multi-state fleets, we have fleets that are based outside of California, inside California. They're going to need to comply with regulations on the trucks that they bring in. On the private side, the regulation applies to any company that has $50 million in gross revenue and more than 50 vehicles, if I remember correctly. But that goes across the entire country. So just because in California you may have a subsidiary of your national company that only has five vehicles, and brings in $1 million, that doesn't mean you're exempt from the regulation. If you've got the other part of your company based in Nevada, and the totality of all operations and income is $50 million, you're included in the regulation. Major change. This regulation affects other states, even though it's written in California. Model your summary for the high priority and federal fleets, the private fleets. Registration requirements uh, in January 2024, newly added trucks must be zero emissions vehicles or near zero emissions vehicles. I'll get into that in another slide. And you're reporting uh, for mileage of tractors over 12 years, and that's not off-road tractors, that's your tractor trailers running down the highway. And then ICE vehicles removed from the fleet. Uh, useful life exceeded January 1st, 2025. These are all your private fleets. Can I be aware of these regulations? There's some great FAQs that CARB staff have released on the Advanced Clean Fleets uh, site. Please take a look at them. There are some mistakes that I found in a couple of those FAQs, and CARB staff is working on correcting them. Here's a model year example for the private fleets and federal fleets. Uh, 2010, uh, you would be able to hold on to a truck with a 2010 engine no longer than 2028. And that's a useful life, which is 18 years or below 800,000 miles. So you, gotta, you have to know that. You'll have the ability to hold on to your current trucks. You may not have the operational capacity to do that because they may be worn out and you need to replace them sooner than that. But you do have that 
advantage that the other components do not have. Uh, the trucks have to be, for this to qualify, they can be no less than 13 years old, and again, 18 years old, or 800,000 miles. Also applies to your yard trucks. The trucks that just sit in the yard or moving trailers around. So be aware of that, because I know a lot of people run very old yard trucks, to, because they're not traveling very far, maybe only used maybe an hour a day. Local and government fleet requirements for us, starting on January 1, 50% of all the new trucks we purchase have to be zero emissions vehicles. So basically the quick way to think of it is for every gasoline, diesel, compressed natural gas, propane, auto gas, liquid, pick any fuel type, for every one of those I want to buy that's over 8,500 pounds, I got to find someplace else in my fleet to place a zero emissions vehicle in. They don't have to be the same make and model, don't have to be in the same class, I just need to find another zero emissions vehicle to replace starting on January 1st. That requirement, the 50% requirement, goes through until December 31st, 2026. Then on January 1st, 2027, it's 100%. For government fleets, through a lot of talk and meetings with uh, car staff, we were able to get them to apply this to our normal replacement program. So if you already have a replacement plan, you know what you're doing. Now you have, you have an idea of when you need to replace vehicles with zero emissions vehicles as long as you maintain either the 50% or the 100%. But that also means for government fleets, if we can maintain our vehicles longer than we really plan to, we can do that, push the vehicle replacement out so we can make sure we get the infrastructure, either private or public, in place to support the ZEVs that we want to purchase. And again, it's 8,500 pounds gross vehicle weight, which is basically a three-quarter ton vehicle and above. But also make sure you check your half-ton trucks. There are certain options packages where you can exceed the 8,500 pound gross vehicle weight rating, even though it's, quote, an F-150 F or a half-ton truck. So you need to look at the actual labels on your trucks to determine if the regulation applies to them or not. Optional zero emissions milestone phase-in. This one required, it, it's, this came about because it was originally provided to uh, drayage fleets and wastewater fleets, and then we asked, well, can we have that option in the government fleets as well? Because we have government fleets that are wastewater, water, and general fleet. And this would be very helpful for them to separate those out and have them apply appropriately. But this option for us as a government fleet is for a percentage of your fleet, similar to the manufacturers, each year or during the years that they list here, you have to have a percentage that starts out at 10% and then grows over the years to 100%. Uh, from my perspective, it's a great option for a small fleet that's already started to transition to zero emissions vehicles. You already have some infrastructure in place, whether it be hydrogen, or electric charging stations, so you're already on the path. So you already have a plan, these dates may coincide, you may be able to do a little bit of movement, and you're fine, you'll be compliant with the regulation. For the much larger, more diverse fleets, the infrastructure is gonna be a much greater challenge. I don't think you can get enough infrastructure in place by 2025 to be compliant with this regulation. Then you've gotta start submitting infrastructure delay re exemption request. Can't actually submit those unless you have an order in for a ZEV. It gets very, very complicated. But I do encourage you to look at this option because it may work for your fleet better than just normal replacement programs. Wastewater and transit fleets, talk a little bit about that. For them, they have a 10% uh, ZEV target that starts in 2027 or 2030, depending on the vehicle and they can defer the ZEV requirement to 2030 uh, for those to elect the ZEV milestone uh, compliance pathway. Transit fleets will skip over. Zero emissions vehicle definitions. Real quick, there are only three types of vehicles that will fall under this regulation to be able to purchase. One is an all-electric vehicle, simple to understand. Next one is a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle, simple to understand. And the third one is a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, which means it could have a gas, 
diesel, compressed natural gas, propane, you pick a fuel, but it's also got the ability to plug into a charging station, charge up a battery, and then based on another regulation, which is in the, in the slide, it tells you how many minimum miles that plug-in hybrid has to travel on all electricity to qualify to be able to be used in our regulation. The reality is there's going to be very few plug-in hybrid electric vehicles available to us. Why? From the manufacturing standpoint, it's more expensive to produce a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle because you have two different power plants. You have to integrate to, together seamlessly compared to just going all in and producing an all-electric truck or going the other direction doing a hydrogen fuel cell truck. So it, it's an option. I think it's a very, very narrow as far as what's going to be available to us, but it is something to look into for your fleet. Repairable vehicles. <laughs> we were sitting in a meeting with CARB staff and we asked the question, because it happens all the time, what happens when we get a wrecked vehicle we can't repair? What do we do in the regulations? And the answer we got back was, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, it happens all, every day in private government fleets in California, they get in accidents, and the damage either exceeds the uh, value of the vehicle, so it's not uh, cost effective to repair it. Quote, it's a total loss, that's what an insurance company calls it. Or the damage to the vehicle are so extent that we can't get a frame for it, we can't actually repair the vehicle whatsoever. Can't find any parts for it. So we explained that to him and said, we hadn't thought about that. So we went back and forth several times. There's now an exemption in there for vehicles that are a total loss. There is paperwork required, accident reports, there's a lot of paperwork in order to use this. Uh, but what we can do is if you've got a vehicle that's a total loss, you can supply the paperwork to car, the paperwork's in order. You can buy a used ICE vehicle, internal combustion engine vehicle, that is has the same configuration with an engine of the same or newer model year as the damaged vehicle. Meaning car doesn't want you to go back and take a 2010 truck that's been crashed and replace it with a 2001 used truck. They want to make sure the emissions are the same. It, Emissions reduction technology is either the same in what you had or better than what you had. But it is a critical little thing that they added to the regulations. It's very important because this happens every day with fleets throughout California. Uh, intermittent snow removal vehicles. Anybody running snow plows on their equipment here? Great, we'll skip that. But there is an exemption for that or a delay. Backup vehicle exemption. Be very careful with this one. It allows government fleets, if you have a truck that uh, operates under 1,000 miles a year, to claim a backup exemption. But you have to prove every year you have to track the mileage, turning reports. We'll be doing that through truckers. Be careful because that exemption is for backup vehicles. I do not have, know how CARB is going to react if you put in your entire fleet is under 1,000 miles. Well, your entire fleet's not backup vehicles. They're just regular vehicles that travel under 1,000 miles. They're used all day long because they've got equipment on the back. They travel five miles and they're used for eight hours a day. That's not a backup vehicle. So be very careful if you decide to use that exemption. Make sure it's truly a backup vehicle. Emergency vehicle definition. First responders, fire, police, law enforcement, ambulances, they have had a rough time understanding regulations in California because, because they're emergency responders, they think they're exempt from every CARB regulation that's ever been produced. And the reality is, some regulations they're exempt from, some they're not. This particular regulation defaults to the vehicle code, and it's very narrowly defined on what an emergency vehicle is. The main thing to take away from here today when you go back to your agencies, if you have any public works department vehicles, they are not exempt. Yes, they have amber lights on them. Yes, they may have sirens on them. They are not exempt. And I don't know why, but that part of our industry believes they're exempt from this regulation. And I want to make sure that they don't get caught out on them. They are not exempt. That's the regulation. 
Uh, it's got the vehicle code up there, section 165. It's in the PowerPoint, so you can refer to it. Send it out to your public works directors and go, guess what, you're not exempt. This is an example from the state and local government exemption process. CARB has until uh, January 1st, 2025 to create a list of vehicles that they have commonly found are not available as a zero emissions vehicle, whether it be the, the chassis type or the combination of the equipment you're putting on the chassis. That list won't be available until January 1st, 2025 or later, but we have the regulation that starts on January 1st, 2024. So what do we do in the meantime? If you have vehicles you can't find a ZEP to replace it with, you're gonna to need to put in an exemption request or use your 50% rule. That exemption request process, there's gonna be a lot of data information you're gonna to need to submit to CARB staff. You submit it, CARB staff has 40, 45 days to respond to your exemption request. If they don't respond within 45 days, your exemption is automatically um, approved. They may, within that 45 days, follow up with you and say, hey, we got your exemption request, we need more data, we don't understand. What type of body is this? Because we just went on the internet on Google and we found a body that fits your needs that's based in Florida. And because you can buy it, you gotta buy it out of Florida. The, the challenge with that exemption process there's no current appeal process. If CARB denies your request, you're done. And what we don't know is if they're gonna track the VIN number that was associated in your exemption request and create some more administrative workload because now you got denied but then you found another truck you could replace with a, a ZEV to get the 50% rule. So now you can buy that truck as a nice rule, but that VIN number is in CARB's website and all their databases, can you actually replace it with a ZEPA? Question we gotta get resolved with CARB staff. Infrastructure extensions. Let's say we all do our best, we've got a project with a local utility provider, we're looking at they're gonna install all the charging infrastructure up to our uh, meter and then we've got the charging station and everything handled after that. And six months into the project, they find a spotted yellow salamander on the property or make up, I don't know, maybe a unicorn would be more appropriate. Find a unicorn on the property. Now they've got to do all sorts of environmental impact studies, all sorts of stuff. Now you can't get your infrastructure in place to support the vehicles you've already ordered. What do you do? Well, you can apply for an extension for infrastructure. If you're approved, it's for two years, or three years, I'm sorry, three years. If you still don't have the infrastructure in place within three years, then you can apply for a final extension, which will be two more years. So the longest you can get for, for an extension is five years on an infrastructure project. Big challenge, because in order to apply for that, you already have to have a project started with the utility provider. Very important to know that. Just because you know the infrastructure is not going to be in place, doesn't mean you get an automatic extension. You have to have a project signed up with somebody to move forward with the infrastructure. Uh, all the requests are gonna be submitted by email through the truckers program, which for government fleets, that's a private fleet's uh, requirement for tracking all the private regulations that have come before ACF. So now we're gonna be playing in their sandbox as far as how we submit all of our data and everything. And again, no appeals process. If they say no, we're denying your extension request, you gotta figure out what to do after that. And this is all, we're all gonna learn this. First set of ex extensions and exemption requests, we're all gonna learn how well it went and things that we didn't think of that we need to be aware of. Same thing with car stuff. Uh, new site electrification delay extension request. There are a number of Requests in there, again, two years, three years, five years, things to be aware of. Uh, one of the challenges that I brought up with CARB staff, and I didn't get very far with them, is let's say today I order a 10-wheel dump truck. It's gonna be an all-electric dump truck. We've got our infrastructure going. The unicorn shows up, and now it's gonna be five years before we have the infrastructure to recharge this truck. Meantime, the truck gets delivered. I have a truck sitting there, brand new, that I can't use for five years, 
This is a specialty truck. It only works out of this remote location. It, the duty cycles aren't such we can move it to a different location or use public charging uh, infrastructure. What's that do operationally for us? First thing is, after five years, you're probably going to have to replace all the tires on the truck because they're going to age out. This truck hasn't been driven. When you drive a truck in the tires, they actually flex, they release some chemicals, and that actually helps prevent ozone cracking and other problems with the tires. Tires aren't being driven on in five years, you need to replace them. Thousands of dollars in tires for tires that may have 50 miles on them. Next thing is the battery warranty. Are the manufacturers going to warranty the battery, the full length of the warranty, based on the in-service date? Right now, I get two answers. One is no, and the other is we don't know. Need to, if you're looking at any manufacturer, you need to know that up front. Is the warranty period for the battery the in-service date or the day that the, the truck's delivered to us? Major difference. If it's a day that was delivered, you've got a five-year extension. First day you put it into service and something doesn't work with it, the battery fails, high voltage system fails, something like that, now what do you do? Now you're paying for a lot of expensive repairs that you've never planned for on a brand new truck. Not to mention you got problems with rubber and the paint and everything else that goes on with a vehicle that's been stored for five years. The other problem is depending on where you live, storage fees are, can be very expensive. In our part of Santa Clara County, for me to store one truck for five years, it's going to run about $22,000 because property is that expensive. So now I've got the acquisition cost, I've got all the rental costs because it, we couldn't put it into service in five years, got to replace the tires, may have to replace a battery, high voltage system, and then on top of that I've got all the storage fees. So what's the total cost of ownership on that truck? Probably not one that will ever pencil out the life of the truck. Uh, more on the delays, 45-day uh, approval process. Both extension requirement types require fleet to begin planning one year ahead for infrastructure installations. So you have to have a plan one year ahead to include in your extension or, or exemption requests. So be aware of that. Procurement, oh boy. Regulation is loading a lot of administrative workload on either fleet or procurement staff. So uh, beginning with our first reporting period is April of each year, April 1st of 2025 is when we have to start reporting this. The fleets that we contract with to provide services, let's say it's a water delivery company, they're bringing water into your facility for your employees to use, that is a fleet you now have to track. Your agency has to track its compliance or its uh, non-applicability to the ACF regulation. Either way, you have to know about that fleet. You have to keep the documentation. You have to keep it for up to three years. It has to be available for car staff to audit. So you've got to go through all your contracts, existing contracts, and add new language into it to inform those entities that use trucks that they need to fill out an attestation whether they, the regulation applies to them or not. If it applies to them, then they need to state that they're in compliance with the regulation. Later on, there will be, it's my understanding, either certificates will be produced for those fleets or the website, the CARB website, will show who is already in compliance or not. So we can go in there, look up the fleet, find out their fleet, their compliance, take a screenshot or print out a certificate, and we have our documentation. You also have to, on uh, vehicles you uh, send off to auction, you've got to add very specific language, it's in the slides, of what you need to make the auction companies give to the potential purchasers or the purchasers of the truck, letting them know that that truck may need to be, or may have the ACF regulation applied to it. So you've got to do that with new contracts, you've got to do that with existing contracts, that means you've got to open up all the contracts you have and amend them if there's trucks involved with it or at least find out that the regulation doesn't apply to them. Keep all the paperwork and track it. When you've got a big fleet, big organization, that's a lot of workflow. In my opinion, that's probably two full-time people, at least for the first couple of years. Uh, 
Okay, real quick examples that this would apply to rental car companies, vehicle leasing companies, trucking companies hired to pick up or deliver large goods, contracted non-government organizations, NGOs, general contractors. We have a verbal response from CARB staff because this came up in the development of the regulation because if we have a large public works project, we have to track the contractors' trucks are compliant with ACF. The problem is most large projects, let's say it's a cement parking garage, 100, 100 vehicles in it. There's not one, just a general contractor, there's subcontractors. Then those subcontractors have subcontractors. Then those subcontractors have subcontractors. And any, anyone, any layer of those could be renting trucks or leasing trucks. How far do we, are we required to go to track all the information on them, whether the truck, their fleets are in compliance with the regulation or the regulation doesn't apply to us. Major administrative workload. We have verbal confirmation and they're supposed to release it in some FAQs coming out that we only have to go to the general contractor level. CARB staff is going to figure out what to do after that. They may actually force the general contractors, which may be private fleets in this room, to go through and look at every subcontractor, their subcontractors, their subcontractors, and all the rental companies and leasing companies. Uh, that on site, you're looking at two full time people for a large project. Something to be aware of. Uh, let's see, these are just more examples of uh, the requirement to hire compliant fleets. Verification, we talked about that. Oh, and you won't be able to hire a non-compliant fleet, just so you're aware. So if you have a non-compliant fleet currently, you don't have 2024 for them to be given to compliance for the reporting in 2025, April 25. So you may lose some of your vendors. Uh, this is the language that needs to be uh, sent out to the, uh, in contracts, in amendments, and RFPs. You have the exact language. Uh, this is the exact language as far as uh, auction companies, especially about contracts with them. Uh, more re this is the, real quick, this regulation transfers a significant workload to fleets, private, government, doing regulatory compliance for CARB staff. Whether you realize it or not, we're collecting all the data, we're submitting all the data to CAR so they can sit in an office, analyze all the data, and then decide which fleets they're going to visit to verify if they're complying or not with the regulation. We're doing a lot of the administrative workload that in previous regulations we didn't take care of, CARB staff did or somebody else did, different organization, such as the Bureau of Automotive Repair. They deal with the smog check program. They're doing the administrative workload and portion of the enforcement workload for a regulation that CARB created. This one creates a lot of administrative workload that's been shifted onto us as fleets. Mutual aid, there are some exemptions for mutual aid. You need to look at it very closely. You have to have contracts in place. Contracts need to have specific language. You have to be careful because if you're providing a mutual aid vehicle, uh, that isn't law enforcement or something that already has an exemption. What's that vehicle during, doing when it's not being used for mutual aid? Uh, you have to submit all the vehicle information. There's a lot of paperwork involved with that. It is something you can take advantage of, but from my perspective, the administrative workload to track and submit all the data to carbon stuff outweighs the benefits of trying to use this extension, unless you're a very small entity. Again, we talked about uh, the hiring entities, Sales disclosure, regulatory oh, penalties. We have had uh, government fleets, very small entities, cities mainly, ask, what are the penalties if we don't comply with the regulation? We reach out to car staff and we get a very non-committal answer. Well, it depends on the situation. And if anybody's ever heard, read, or dealt with car penalties, it does depend on the situation. Depends on how blatantly you ignored the laws or acted to be non-compliance versus 
He did everything right. He made a pig warfare. Radically different penalties for that. Uh, they won't give us a committal on it. I did some calculations. Worst case scenario per infraction could be $1.1 million. That's if they use all their authority and all the different fees that they can uh, to apply to you as a penalty. Reality is, if you're a small fleet and you're flagrantly avoiding this regulation, it's probably going to be between $500,000 and $2 million. Because it won't just be for one vehicle. And a lot of the fines apply for each instant. So if you got 100 vehicles, the penalty times 100. And I do expect CARB will make an example of the first fleet that chooses to do nothing and just pay penalties. So just be aware of that. Uh, reporting deadlines again for government fleets, it's uh, April 1st of each year and going forward. And that goes out until I believe 2040. Some of the information we need to collect and supply to CARB through the truckers for uh, uh, software, then vehicle make a model, vehicle model year, vehicle license plate, GVWR, vehicle type, fuel and power train type, uh, date vehicle was purchased was made, date vehicle was added or removed from the California fleet, which you have to do within uh, 30 days. If you add a vehicle to the fleet or send one off to auction or dispose of it some other way, you have to go into truckers and put that information in within 30 days. Uh, odometer readings, Engine family, very important. Uh, depending on the vehicle type, the decals or the labels may be worn off on the engine. You're going to have to reach out to the manufacturers, give them a VIN number, and find out what the engine, mo engine model year and engine family are. Similar to what we had to do when we did the um, retrofitting of diesel trucks with uh, DPF devices and other things. You have to know all that information and submit it. Data for the exemptions and requests, uh, contract start and end dates for vehicle purchase with California State funding, ZAP purchase requirements, more dates, more dates, more dates. There's dates and just data. If you do not have a really good working Excel sheet or fleet in management information software system, you are going to struggle. The data that you've got to collect and track is enormous. Thousands of cells of data depending on your fleet size. Real important, you start looking at this. Car staff did release a sample spreadsheet that you can use to check your compliance. It's very basic, you enter it some basic information, and you can see if you're gonna be in compliance depending on the dates you choose and other things. It's on their website, I encourage you to download it because it helps you understand the information that they're looking for, whether you wanna use their Excel, Excel spreadsheet or not. Emergency miles, you have to track all the miles of any vehicles used in a declared emergency, and that's a statewide. Local emergencies are a question if you'll get any exemptions for miles if you're using the backup plan or, any, or option or anything else as an exemption. Joint compliance reporting. Uh, let's see here. 30 days. Going through this quickly because I want to give everybody an opportunity to ask questions. Backup vehicle, again, you've got to track the odometer readings. Websites, workable links in the PDF that you'll get, their main website. The final order, I encourage everybody to read the final order that applies to you. It's actually very helpful in standing, understanding the regulation because unfortunately CARB staff have been making mistakes on the interpretation of the actual regulations in their FAQs. They're catching them, they're fixing them. But I don't want somebody to make a decision, especially long term, that may be incorrect because what you read in the FAQs or on CARB's website or through a webinar is not actually what the regulation states. So real important when you can't sleep over a weekend, two nights in a row, great thing to put you to sleep. Read the regulations. Uh, if you have never done it or you haven't gone back there and check it, CARB staff, CARB has email servers. This is the link, it shows you what to look for. You can go in there and you can choose what type of email blast you get from CARB. Uh, for me, everything fleet related, there's about 58 different email lists. But that means every day I get between one and four emails from CARB programs. But that's an idea of how many different regulations apply to our operations. But it's real quick and easy to use. 
great way of getting the information right away and not depending on associations or anybody else to forward it to you. Uh, compliance options. We talked about the ZEB milestone. Purchase percentage requirements, which is uh, also can be a challenge again for government fleets. 50% up until 12, 31, 26. Um, Challenge with, challenges we have right now. The regulation does not require a dealership, warranty station, or a manufacturer to be within a certain amount of miles of your fleet. If you're used to standardizing your vehicle purchases around a particular manufacturer, those days are pretty much over with. If there is one ZEB vehicle sold by one manufacturer, anywhere in the state of California and it is identical to your needs needs and the classification of the truck you got to purchase it even if there's only one manufacturer of one model how do you standardize around that you're going to have to talk to your procurement staff and let them know acquiring these vehicles is going to be completely different than what we're used to we're going to send out a bid and there's only going to be one respondent and we're not going to send any more bids out we're going to send out a bid, there's going to be no response. Well, that doesn't give you an exemption for purchase. purchasing the vehicle, it just means somebody didn't respond to you. Then you've got to reach out to them and go, hey, I need a quote. Same process we've had to do with specialty vehicles. But just be aware of that. One manufacturer, one vehicle in California, if it meets your needs, you're going to have to purchase it. Manufacturers. The manufacturers right now are focusing on the low-hanging fruit to either go hydrogen all-electric, plug-in hybrid electric, or all-electric. Low-hanging fruit, perfect application, potato chip trucks. Big truck, lots of volume, but nothing weighs anything in the back of the truck. Perfect for a, a battery electric vehicle. Range is good. They're not, you're not going to stress the drivetrain, the batteries or anything. You're good from point A to point B in a defined area. They're not traveling all up and down the state. They do bigger trucks for that. Perfect application for it. They're focusing on that. They're focusing on partial delivery trucks. Why? Because you have Amazon, you've got UPS, you've got FedEx. There's a huge group of uh, owners of large fleets that will pay a lot for a lot of vehicles. The fleets that they're, I don't know, Class 8, they're focusing on Class 8. Everything in between is difficult for the manufacturers because we have all sorts of different bodies that go on the chassis. We have all sorts of different use cases. We have vehicles that travel five miles in a day but work all day long with the diesel engine or gasoline engine powering up a PTO. Very hard. So now you've got, you're buying a, a BEV, let's say an F450 or C450. 4500, you're buying it as all electric vehicle, and you find out that you can't tap into the motor battery to power auxiliary equipment on the back of the truck. So now you've got to figure out, I've got to add another battery to the chassis. Where is it going to fit? What, what's it rated at? Can it go eight hours operating a winch, a crane, or a boom? How much is that battery pack going to weigh? How am I going to charge that battery pack? Mr. Rachel will get into more details in his presentation about that. But that's why the manufacturers are focusing on potato chip trucks, delivery trucks, cargo delivery trucks, and Class A. Those are the easiest use cases to produce vehicles for. So right now, from my conversations with manufacturers, our vocational trucks, we will not see a hydrogen fuel cell vocational truck until in mass until about 2026 sometime. In mass, the battery electric trucks in, in this range of the vocational, probably about the same time. So what do you do in the meantime to be in compliance with the regulation? You've got to figure it out. Every fleet's different. I've never met two fleets that are identical. Questions for training, for, uh, planning for the transition. These are questions you need to ask yourself. What steps are available for purchase in the near term? What zips are available to order and be manufactured versus holding an order or taking a pre-purchase order or just a reservation? Major difference. These manufacturers, we've already had one manufacturer go out of business. 
I suspect there's going to be a couple more here in the near future. When you get a reservation, you've got all your paperwork in order, and then it doesn't get delivered. Now what are you going to do? You know, start over the process. But now you may be at the 100% mark for a government fleet. So you have to purchase a ZEV. You can't do an ICE because that ZEV's no longer available. Can the infrastructure be in place in time for the ZEVs? Infrastructure is a whole other topic. I can tell you right now, talking to utility providers in the state of California, one, they don't know how big this challenge is going to be as far as supplying the infrastructure and the power through the infrastructure. And two, they were thinking that they would need to have things in place starting in 2027 because of an interpretation of one of the components of this regulation. They're, they're struggling. They're challenged. Uh, in our original ACT reporting requirements for large fleets, we had to give them all this information about our fleet. The intent of all that was it was going to be shared with utility providers so they could start understanding how big of a challenge it is in California on the electrical grid and infrastructure portion. For reasons that are related to the threat of lawsuits, that information has never been shared, as I'm aware, to date with the utility providers. The best thing we can all do is reach out to our utility providers as quickly as possible and give them an idea of what we want to do. I've got a slide a little bit later that will give you a little bit more insight into how big the challenge is for them. Where's the nearest step dealership? Is it 10 miles or 500 miles away? Uh, you see a lot of data about uh, the total cost of ownership on a battery electric vehicle. That it actually is less than a conventional vehicle. Acquisition costs are higher. It ignores the infrastructure cost, and what and they're guessing at the resale value, but the resale values they're guessing at might be too high. But you talk about that as a lower total cost of ownership per mile, blah blah blah. All it takes is to have a dealership 500 miles away, and you've got to take it there four or five times for warranty work to wipe out the cost savings, the cost difference. I don't know about you, but for me to get a Class 8 truck towed to Southern California and back is thousands and thousands of dollars. Just something to be aware of. You need to be looking into that as you're looking at the Zeb manufacturer. And can you perform warranty work in-house? Manufacturers right now are very hesitant about that. They need to guarantee that your staff are qualified and trained and knowledgeable to work with high voltage, uh, systems and be aware of contact release training, arc flash training, and high voltage system training. I don't know where they're going to go with that if you're going to continue to be able to warranty work other than little things like sun visors falling on, headlight bulbs, things like that. Will your maintenance and repair facility need to be remodeled, extended, or replaced to meet OSHA requirements? OSHA's currently requiring a 10 foot distance between the electric truck and the next closest object. Well, for our main fleet facility, actually all of our facilities, all five of them, we don't have 10 feet clearance when we lift a truck up on a lift, the roof scoop up. Because we've all done the right thing, we've taken everything that's on the ground, all the tripping hazards, and we put them on the roof and hung them down with uh, reels. We have lots of metal up on our roofs. I can't get 10 foot clearance. So I either need to raise the roof on one section of my facility, extend onto the facility, or build a new facility. 10 foot every direction. Our work bays weren't set up for 10 feet every direction, other than maybe transit. That means you've got to get 10 feet away from the roll-up door when you pull the truck in. You've got to be 10 feet away from the work aisle that's out in front of you. It's a big challenge. And then, in one instance, Mr. Rencher ran, in, ran into this. At one time, in building concrete floors for maintenance facilities, they used metal flakes to impregnate the concrete to strengthen it up. Now you've got metal in the floor. How do you get 10 feet away from metal in the floor? You've got to put a special sealant on the full floor to make sure it's non-conductive. These are all just little things that we've learned over the last couple of years delving into all of this. More questions. Fire marshal, will they approve it? The NFPA is getting wiser about electric vehicle fires. There's more guidance being uh, released, and I suspect they'll be adding more and more. Uh, you need to check with your fire marshal, especially if you're going to do hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. If you're going to open the hydrogen system, 
within a facility that requires a remodel similar to what you would do with a compressed natural gas facility. You need to be aware of that. Storing the batteries, if, you're, if you think you're going to be bringing in brand new batteries, swapping out and storing them at the facility, more requirements. You need a specialized space, airflow. Ideally, it's outside away from the facility. Uh, the dealerships. This one's very concerning for me because I keep on asking dealerships and owners of dealerships, what are you guys doing on the safety aspect of the dealerships? The 10-foot clearance, all these other requirements. Most of the time, I get, I don't know what you're talking about, what do you mean? The manufacturers are not sharing guidance with the dealerships on what the dealerships have to do. A lot of different reasons for it. There's some business models related to it. It's a lack of knowledge as well. It's, there's just a lot of challenges with that, and they're dealing with multiple states. So we're going to need to figure out what we need to do. And we may be in a situation where a dealership gets shut down that process a lot of volume of workforce or can because they had an OSHA violation because they weren't in compliance for the safety related to hydrogen and, and battery electric trucks. Just something to think about. Uh, let's see here. Oh, batteries. The fleets that already purchased DEV and mostly it's transit and already had those vehicles in the fleet and had to replace the battery. When they purchased them original, the quickest thing was that everybody asked, when do I need to replace the battery and how much it's going to cost? The when has probably been close to accurate. The cost has not. We've got an example. It's about 2x what they were told originally. Now we run into the problem backwards compatibility. Let's say we've got a ZEP truck. We're up 10 years. It's time to replace the battery, and I can't get a battery. Well, why can't I get a battery? Is that manufacturer and technology has moved on in 10 years. Using a completely different chemical makeup, completely different high voltage system needs to be used. Can you retrofit the truck? Probably not. Now you've got a truck that you plan on keeping 12 years, 15 years, 18 years, and you can't get the battery, the fuel source, to keep it running. What do you do? you got to start thinking about that stuff. You need to ask the manufacturers point blank and have put down in writing how long the batteries are going to be available. We're already running into it on the light duty fleet side. Nissan Leaf was an example. We had another fleet manager bought a Nissan Leaf doing the right thing. They had a battery problem. Went into a dealership to get the battery placed under warranty. One month goes by, two months goes by, three months goes by, four months go by, five months, six months. No answer when they're going to get a battery, when he's going to get a battery. Lemon Law, he got a new vehicle. That is not as uncommon as people think. Tesla has publicly stated that the battery prices that they originally forecast, they're a lot higher. And they're one of the largest manufacturers of EVs. Got These are questions you need to figure out. Ask the manufacturers, have them put it in writing to help uh, minimize the impacts on your operations. Biggest question of all for everybody in the room, how many have budget to do a zero emission vehicle transition? Great. I'm raising my hand just as an example because I don't either. Very expensive process that we're going to go through. A lot of upfront costs. Hopefully after the upfront costs, we will realize lower total operation costs. So you've got to start looking for funding. Again, these are the low-hanging fruit. These are different types of vehicles that uh, the manufacturers are focusing on. Everybody yeah. around can't see these. These are real challenging vehicles, concrete pumping trucks, dump trucks, vacons, and large aerials. Very challenging for the manufacturers for them to be all electric. Hydrogen fuel cell electric, yes, those will all work for those. But we've got a limited supply of hydrogen fuel stations in California. 2009, Governor Schwarzenegger, started the hydrogen highway, uh, had the CEC uh, present a lot of funding available to produce hydrogen stations up and down the I-5 corridor. Since 2009, this goes back a while, we have approximately right now an operation on any given day in California, about 87 public hydrogen fuel stations. Now compare that to 10,000 gasoline, diesel, compressed natural gas, propane 
check any other vehicle fluid type. That's how many we have in each of those stations. I haven't been able to find the data, but my guess is they process 1,500 cars a day. And we've got less than 100 public hydrogen fuel stations. I believe in hydrogen fuel cell trucks. I think it's the answer. But we've got to have the infrastructure, and we don't have time because the regulation goes through effect in January. Uh, very expensive to build a hydrogen fuel station. Upfitting limitations, talked a little bit about that. Amperage restrictions, you need to know that from the manufacturers. Can you install an auxiliary 12 volt battery? Manufacturers we've talked to so far, no. So if you're adding equipment, light bars, sirens, stuff like the vehicle, you need to talk to the manufacturer before you order a battery or even a, hy a hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle. Where can they be mounted? Are you going to have to go up in a greater uh, weight class of the truck because now you've added an auxiliary battery on the back, so now you're carrying more weight on it? Are you, have you exceeded the GVWR? Now you go up to a greater weight classification truck. Does it actually fit in an operational area? It used to be as now that truck is longer and wider than what you had before. All things that you need to think about. Uh, what happens when the 12 volt battery is discharged? This one I learned, uh, Mr. Wrenchley, and then doing some checking myself, never thought about it. Electric vehicle is dead. It can't go anywhere. Well, the 12 volt battery is dead. Doesn't mean the motor battery is dead. Tow truck shows up and the vehicle won't roll. They can't move it into a position, pushing, towing, stretching it to get it lined up so they can put it on a flatbed. Well, why is that? Because when the vehicle dies, if you turn the wheels over a couple times, you create electricity because of regenerative braking. If the vehicle's been in an accident or has had a major failure, you could get shocked by the vehicle by rolling. Different manufacturers approach that differently. Some have systems that will allow the vehicle to roll a certain distance. They capture the regenerative energy from the motors being turned and put it into a capacitor. Not all manufacturers do that. You need to know that is you may need to tow truck, tell tow truck companies you show up, you got to bring a big jack, jack up each wheel, put it on a dolly, rotate it into a position that it will work, and then tow it up with dollies all the way up on the flatbed, which is challenging because the dollies go in multiple directions at one time. Battery replacement. This is the example of the battery replacement costing two times. So on the left side, the total originally when a battery was replaced was $44,547 on a transit bus. The grand total, second time around, $82,335. Big difference if you're told $42,000 and you get out and it's 85000 your total cost of ownership model just went out the door. And that's just one, one truck, one battery model. And that's based on that battery being compatible with the chassis. Because the technology had moved so far forward that you couldn't use that particular battery. Accidents, just real quick, there's a lot of data out there about accidents. One thing you need to know is electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles. There's really not a whole lot of data out there because they're a smaller percentage of the overall vehicle population that is physically driving on the road. So there's first responder information, things that you need to be aware of. Uh, in general, if a, a battery electric vehicle catches on fire, if it's due to the battery packs in an accident, it goes into a thermal runaway event, the temperatures can reach 1400 degrees, the batteries don't catch on fire, it's everything around them from heat catches on fire. So it's carpets, floor mats, seat covers, steering wheels, dashes, headliners, everything in the vehicle can catch on fire. The batteries are not toxic waste when you use water to cool the battery packs down. It's everything else in the car that mixes with the, the water can be toxic, a hazardous waste spill. You need to be aware of that because you may be on the hook for a vehicle that burns to the ground next to a stream or a storm drain. And I've seen the hazmat bills for situations like that for fleets. They range anywhere from a low of $5,000 up to $20,000 for the cost of cleaning up a hazmat spill. The battery, to cool down the batteries, to keep them from igniting everything in the interior and exterior of the vehicle can take 
anywhere from 1,500 gallons of water to 40,000 gallons of water. Depends on a, li a lot of different things. NFPA right now is instructing uh, fire first responders around the country, you need to make a decision about the vehicle. Do you let it burn to the ground and create toxic smoke, or do you try to put it out with the chance that the runoff from the vehicle, 40,000 gallons, may end up in a stream or into a storm drain where it should be? So when you come to the site, they're asking them to look at the site, consider everything, and make a decision on what you're going to do on that vehicle. Uh, let's see here. Dedicated containment systems for fires. Um, real quick, these slides you can't see them, but they're examples of, of vehicles that are caught on fire, fire mainly transit buses. Um, interesting, I wish you could see the top one. You'll see it in the handout. It's a uh, transit bus that was a hybrid system. A little scooter was brought in that was battery electric, and the scooter caught on fire, had a, a battery meltdown. The scooter caught the seats on fire, and then it went from there and the whole bus burned to the ground. But in the top of the picture is the hybrid battery, completely intact. Even though it had all that temperature around it, nothing happened with it. It was, it was great to see that. Uh, this one, I'll just, I'll talk about it, can't really see it. Uh, General Motors went through first responders with them, kudos to them, great program. Wish they rolled it out and continued to do it to, uh, to all the states. It was a, they come to the state and have multiple places you could attend. Uh, you'd have to push away to the head of the line because it's mainly for fire and police. But we were able to get in. Uh, they told us that they want a 50 foot radius between a damaged EV and the next closest object. So that's a 100 foot diameter. I do not have a 100 foot diameter at any of my facilities for anything, even a slip and slide. I can't put it out there. We have no room. How are we going to deal with this? They also say that if you, if there's damage to the battery pack, which most of them are going to be skateboard, they're going to be underneath. You can look underneath, you can see if the battery pack's damaged or not. Take a thermal camera and see if, you're, if it's already started a thermal runaway event. They require a 48 hour to two week quarantine period. The vehicle gets moved into a location it won't be moved from. It's within a 100 foot diameter, 50 foot radius, any direction, and you have to monitor it each day. Make sure the battery pack doesn't start to go on a thermal runaway event and catch on fire. I don't have that space. Our truck truck drivers don't have that space. I don't know of any fleet that has that space. So you've got to figure that out. You may need to lease space. You may need to find some space that's available, grade it, take trees down, put uh, different aggregate in so it doesn't catch fire, get plastic chain, and every damaged EV that's anywhere near the high voltage system or the battery pack, you put it in the middle and wait two weeks. I don't know what that distance is for a medium heavy duty truck or a transit bus. I have not gotten any information every time I ask a manufacturer about those three types and I don't get any information back. I suspect is they don't want to tell us it needs to be a 200 or 300 foot radius. Things to think about. It's going to be a rough ride to get this intermission vehicle. It's the right thing to do, but we've got a lot of operational challenges that we need to verify and uh, be prepared for. Uh, this is one of our facilities. It shows what work our plan is. We'll be able to house two electric trucks or vehicles at any given time uh, for quarantine. We're going to have all of our tow truck providers. We're going to provide them some training, what to look for. We're going to see if they can get a, a thermal imaging camera so they can check the batteries to verify if they're going into a thermal runaway event before they put them on their truck and catch fire. And then all the vehicles are going to be towed to one of our fleet facilities, plastic chain around them, and they'll be quarantined for 48 hours to two weeks before we do anything with them. Uh, other thing we learned from that training, what uh, first manufacturers want you to do is break out, roll down or break out the windows of the vehicle. If the battery started a thermal runaway event, the battery doesn't pose a threat from hazardous waste. It's the heat that's created. But what does come from the batteries, depending on its chemical makeup, is hydrogen gas. That's one of the possibilities. So what they want to do is you still have a 12 volt system engaged. It's still safe to do, so roll the windows down. If not, break out the side windows. Why? 
is a hydrogen gas gets into the vehicle and it becomes an encapsulated bomb. Because now it's a thermal wire array event, you got hydrogen in there, next thing you have happens, something catches fire, and you got the right air fuel mixture ratio, and they explode, and the windows go one way, and people standing around go another way. Just something to be aware of. I uh, can't see those well. Uh, in Europe, they've already started working with containment systems. Basically, they're metal containers that the vehicle is, or, is either dropped into by a crane or towed in through uh, with a cable system. Once they get in, they fill them full of water, and that is your management of a thermal runaway event on a battery electric vehicle, and then they wait. Uh, now they're recommending to add salt to the water to help dissipate the energy from the batteries. But once you do that, that'd be, well actually, once you do any of this, that vehicle's a total loss. You're not gonna, doesn't matter what it is, you're not gonna put that back on the road. Just things to be aware of. Take home trucks, big challenge. On a number of different fronts, one commuter miles. If your employee is commuting 100 miles a day, 50 miles each way, they may use up all the range of the vehicle, so if they got a call to respond to an emergency in the middle of the night, they may not actually be able to get there. Or if they can, they may not have enough battery to operate lights or anything else. You need to look at take-home vehicles very closely. You may need to go the route that we're considering, where we set up depots around the county where those, those employees travel with their own vehicles to pick up a battery electric vehicle at these depots and then respond to an emergency. The other big challenge that is becoming, that insurance companies are becoming aware of and risk managers is if you have a employee who already has a charging station at home willing to plug their work vehicle into it to charge it up overnight to extend the range in case of an emergency, do you really want to do that? Because there's been battery electric fires where it's taken out the entire house. It starts in the garage, goes through the entire house, now who's liable for that? Everybody's going to be pointing fingers each way, but the employees out of the house need some place to stay. They're going to be looking at your government agency to provide them housing and a lot of other things. Is you made them take a battery electric vehicle home and plug it in. Doesn't matter if they're plugging their charging station created the fire. Doesn't matter what caused the fire. From a risk standpoint, you're deep pockets. Uh, insurance companies are becoming aware of this and they're declining coverage. I haven't got any specific examples yet, but that's what I've been told. Private fleets, you need to tell them where you're going to park a battery electric or hydrogen truck. You need to tell your insurance companies and see what they respond with. They're going to want distance. They're not going to want them parked inside a facility. They're going to want them in a lot. And as they learn more about this industry and the transition, they're going to put more requirements on you to keep your insurance premiums low or lower than they would be otherwise. Recent one that uh, I was just talking to a, a charging station provider here today. Uh, we have been told by charging station manufacturers that when there's a power outage, when everything comes back on, it will restart the session between the vehicle and the charging station and continue charging the battery. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I had my plug-in hybrid car plugged into a public available charging station, our fleet facility, and another station had a problem. I went and flipped the wrong circuit breaker, came out and realized I turned off the power to my own vehicle. No big deal. Went back, turned it back on, flipped the correct circuit breaker, and walked out there, dealt with the station that had a problem, went back, flipped the circuit breaker on, 10, 15 minutes, walked back to my car, and it's not charging. Session didn't even engage. Didn't restart, didn't do anything. It was like I had disconnected the vehicle, put the plug back into it, and it's just waiting for another car to pull up and plug in. So I'm going, okay, I must have done something wrong when I plugged it in in the morning. So I grabbed some fleet vehicles, lined them up, and plugged them in, went and flipped the circuit breaker, waited two minutes, flipped it back on, and walked out. None of the vehicles started the session over again. So I called fleet managers in California that I knew that had charging stations and different types of vehicle, asked them to do the same thing. Some worked, some didn't. Then I started discovering the research that I did, the handoff, the communication between the vehicle and the charging station is what starts the session. That handoff is all based on safety. 
They're trying to avoid people getting shocked or doing something with a vehicle or charging station they should know, like trying to power a hot plate or an electric bicycle or something like that. That communications doesn't always work well. What's the problem with that? I have 48 different overnight parking locations for our fleet. If I put charging stations in all 48 locations and we have a countywide blackout, and then the power comes back on at, let's say, oh, 2 o'clock in the morning, or not make it earlier, say 12.30, we have to send somebody out with the keys for all those trucks, keys for the facilities, the little activation cards for the charging stations, and restart sessions manually. I don't have staff for 48, or 48 facilities to do that. I don't have them on call 24 hours a day to do that. And then what happens if you have another quick power interruption after they've gone out, gotten back home, got back in bed, apologized to the kid, the wife, the dog, the cats, try to go back to sleep, and then they get a phone call from me and say, hey, power went out again, and you should go back out there. You need to be cognizant Talk to the manufacturers of the charging stations and the vehicles. When you're talking to the charging station manufacturer, what makes and models have you tested and guarantee a charging session will restart on? Then you need to go to the OEM manufacturer and go, what charging stations have you worked with and communicated with and can guarantee that a charge session will restart? Worst thing we can have happen as we do this transition is if vehicles are not charged up fully the first thing in the morning, when somebody comes in to pick up the vehicle and go do their work for the day. We have got to have those vehicles charged up every time. Something to be aware of. Make sure you have a backup plan of three days for power outages. We all gotta figure that out. It's all gonna be different for all of us. Is it a battery backup at the facility? Is the charging station also a battery? Uh, do you have mobile, solar, or some other way of recharging those vehicles? Which vehicles are you gonna going to recharge, which are more important than the others, you've got to come up with a plan for that. Those are the OSHA requirements, pictures, training, training is critical, um, look for it, try to find it, get your people into it. For me, the primary training we're doing right now is contact release, which means what do you do when somebody's got their hand on a hot wire fence, how do you help them, how do you save them, how do you get them to let loose of that hot water fence. I lived in the country, we used to do that to city folk all the time. Come out and we got 12 locals holding their hands together, oh, grab this, you'll feel a light shock, and then we all let go, and they're still holding onto the fence, and then they can't let go. You need to be aware of that. You need to have contact release training, arc flash training. We're dealing with high voltage, high amperage systems. An arc flash can jump 10 feet on some of these trucks. That's why they want the 10 foot radius around the truck is for arc flash. Got to go through arc flash, they got to understand PPE. Those are the three things I'm working on with all our fleet personnel because there are given days in the winter that we may have uh, half our staff out ill. Well, that could be all the staff that we did training for electric trucks on and everybody left in the facilities never gone through the training. I do not want to jeopardize, jeopardize their lives because we decided not to give the training to all of our staff. The more staff that have the training, including supervisors and managers, the better. Because it is a team effort to be safe around these vehicles, especially if they're damaged in some, some way. So training is important. Uh, different associations, we're coming together, we're working on this, trying to get the training out there. Uh, the training that I'm using right now is through the California Transit, uh, Transit, I forgot what the other T is, it's CTTC. They have online training for the contact release and then in-person training for the arc flash and then they'll also do uh, in-person training of transit buses. And that's where you need to be looking at right now because training is woefully inadequate, but you want to look at the vehicles that we already have out on the roads that have a lot of voltage and amperage and big batteries in them. Take that training and get educated. First responders, real quick. Police and fire think they're the only, and ambulance think they're the only first responders. Your fleet staff and the dealerships and the auto body shops are all first responders. Why do I say that? 
they see more vehicles that have been damaged in an accident than the actual firefighters, police, and ambulances do. Why? For a lot of different reasons, particularly in California, if I get in an accident with a car, another car, I call 911, first question is, is anybody injured? Nope, minor fender bender. Next question is, are the vehicles leaking any fluids? Nope, they're dry. Third question is, are they blocking a major thoroughfare? Nope, we're just in a neighborhood. It was a, in a court, we had an accident, we got damaged, vehicles can't drive anywhere. Okay, great, we're not sending anybody out, out at all. Call your insurance company, exchange information, take pictures of the damage, call your auto body shop, your fleet maintenance facility, and have them send the tow truck out. Not a problem when you have a gasoline or diesel powered vehicle. It's pretty obvious that it's on fire or going to be because you're going to see fuel or smell fuel or you're going to see something else that concerns you. Completely different in a battery electric vehicle because you don't know if the battery's been twisted or a cell's contacted it, something else in that battery pack and started a thermal runaway event. You don't know that. So for us, we're doing first responder training for our staff. We want them to know what the first responders know so if we get a vehicle delivered, and we go out there with a thermal camera and we look at the battery pack and we see it's heating up to 600 degrees, what do we do? We get away from the vehicle as quickly as possible, we break out the windows, we quarantine off the entire area and call 911 and get the fire department out there. How many fleets know to even look right now? I would say maybe 25 fleets in the entire state know to do that. We gotta get this information out there. We gotta get our staff into first responders training. And that training benefits the first responders as well and the OEM manufacturers. When we went through the GM training, it was great because we told them about the engineering of the vehicle, where they could take the jaws of life and cut through on these light duty UVs, where not to touch anything, what to look for. They're telling us what they're gonna do when they come out and respond to the things they're worried about. And then General Motors is taking down notes is they did not intend for fleet to be in that meeting. We, I pushed to get in there because I wanted to learn. The reality is it was beneficial for all three parts of the success of dealing with an accident. You need to also be part of that. You need to help out the manufacturers, help out your first responders. If you hear about first responders to the manufacturers, make sure your, your actual first responders know about it and your fleet staff into the training. Tow truck drivers, we talked about that. Charging infrastructure, ZEV warranties, we talked about that. Exemptions, again, up to five years. We talked about facilities and vehicle costs, 1.5 to five times more expensive than gasoline or diesel. Uh, there's very little information on the higher end of the classes, so you're gonna need to do a lot of research. Um, charging infrastructure, let me give you a quick example. Budget, you all, already all know you need a lot of fun. Funding for all this. There's an example of some costs we save with pg &E. There's a breakdown of our fleet of ACF trucks over the next five years. Challenges, that's a cost. That's the um, numbers, types of vehicles. But for us, $28 million for ACF charging infrastructure alone in the next five years. We're just one fleet. This slide, if nothing else, take it from the presentation to put a screenshot out of it and send it to your executive management. For our fleet, 454 trucks in the next five years, when we're all done on a daily basis, they will consume the equivalent of seven Empire State Buildings of electricity, but in a better way of illustrating that, between 28,000 and 47,000 homes of electricity. The electrical utility providers don't know how big of the draw we're going to put on their network. I am one fleet. Multiply that times thousands of fleets in California with much larger trucks than we have. Very important, share that. Please get it out there. Collaboration required. These are all the different people that we need to work with to make this happen. Real quick questions, even though we have one minute. And I'll be around afterwards. What was the mega on that tax slide total? Total was seven times nine, whatever that ends up being. Thought I had it on there. And that's daily? That's daily. 
Yeah, grid, grid infrastructure, a completely different presentation. A lot of stuff to know there. I'll leave that up. Okay, any other quick questions? I don't want to keep you away from the next uh, setup here. Great, if you have any questions, see me afterwards. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it.